thunder rumbled in the sky. Rain poured down on a nearby bus stop, the drops landing on a young man called Kanal. The roof of the bus stop was cracked, giving him no protection from the furious storm. He had been waiting for this bus for over an hour, but to no avail. The drops weighed him down, dragging his hopes down with him. He scanned his surroundings, but there was nothing much to see. A long stretch of road led off into the darkening clouds, and in front of him, a forest of bare trees loomed over him. They had lots of holes and scratches, making them look a bit like people. Imagining the trees with menacing faces, pointing their long, outstretched, hand-like branches, laughing at him, just made him angrier. To hell with the bus, I need some shelter. Still, nothing looked like it had the potential to be of use to him. Kunal looked up to the heavens and prayed, Please, Lord, help me find sanctuary, just for tonight. As if on cue, the land lit up in a blinding white light, as lightning cracked the sky, illuminating the silhouette of a house behind the trees for a second, and then the light was gone. He ran through the trees, swatting away the small branches, until finally he arrived at his destination. The house looked dull and foreboding, with its cracked windows and withering paint. Nal stepped onto the wooden decking, and there was a loud creak. He looked around to see if anyone had heard, but as he thought, there was no one in sight. Taking another step forward, he looked up in time to see a tile fall from the roof. He leapt back, and the tile fell to the ground, where he stood only a moment ago. If he was in his normal state, Kunal would have taken this as a sign to walk away, but he was desperate. Just ask the owner if anyone, if I can stay tonight. He murmured to himself. Knocking on the door, he said, Hello? Is anyone home? There was no reply, but a minute later, the door opened into the dark. He poked his head inside, but saw nothing but black. He took out his phone and turned on torch. He saw a hallway with a few doors and a staircase. Every so often, some light emerged through the black painted windows. Here goes nothing, he whispered, stepping into the hallway. He felt a slight push forward, as if an invisible force went through him and then knocked the air out of his lungs. He was so scared, so unsettled, he wanted to bolt from the door. Weighing his options, he decided he'd rather be in here than in the pouring rain. Moving his hand across the wall, he found a light switch. Click! The noise was deafening in the silence, but no light came on. He opened the nearest door, and a stench hit his nostrils. It smelt like degrading wood. Walking in, he took in the furniture. On the far end of the room, he saw a small but thick TV, its buttons and dials missing, revealing only springs. He then noticed something that resembled a sofa. Moss was crawling up the sides and the fabric was shredded, cotton bursting out like a water from a cracked dam. He walked forward to a coffee table, and there lay a letter. Gnarl opened the flap and took up the letter. There was only one sentence in red-coloured text that looked like it was written with a stick. It read, I will get you for what you did. With a jolt, he dropped it, seeing something dark move behind him. He calmed when he saw it was his own stretched out shadow. But the shadow shrank and moved to the wall in front of him and morphed into the shape of a woman. It raised its hand and let out a guttural scream that pierced his ears. Dropping to the ground, Kanal covered his ears and closed his eyes. Cautiously, he opened his eyes, but the shadow was gone. Kanal wondered if he was losing his mind. He stumbled along, still shaken by what he had seen, pondering whether or not he should stay there, but then again, he'd be waiting for a bus that would never come. His resolve hardened at the thought, so he ventured on. He tried opening the next door, but it was rusted shut. He gave it a small shove and fell forward as the door unlatched. Instantly, he recognized this as a kitchen. The table had deep scratches and scrapes. The stove was corroded and the chair was toppled over, and one leg was broken. The countertop had a big brown stain, which looked suspiciously like... No, couldn't be blood, could it? On the countertop was a kitchen cabinet full of plates, positioned vertically. Knoll was thrown aback because the plates had one feature the rest of the house didn't. It was clean. They were immaculately polished with elaborate designs. 
it was clear that whoever positioned the plates wanted to show them off. They were so clean that he could see his reflection clearly. Leaning in to take a closer look, his blood turned cold when he saw a woman standing behind him. She was in a white dress stained yellow with age, her face not visible under the dark hair covering her eyes and nose. Jumping to the left, he picked up the broken chair leg and held it in front of him as if it were a weapon. His eyes darted from left to right, but saw nobody there. His voice strained with panic. Who's there? Show yourself! No one appeared, but a gust of wind ruffled his hair. I'm inside. Where is the wind coming from? Thought a small, rational part of his brain. He took this as a sign to leave. He bolted to the front door, taking his chair leg with him. He tugged the door handle, but it seemed to be locked. What's going on here? Let me out! Nothing happened. He banged on the door, screaming, Help! Help! Seeing nowhere else to go, he ran up the stairs into the only room up there. There was a double-sized bed and a full-scale mirror. No one else was here, so the only way someone could get to him was from the way he'd just come. Turning back, he held his chair leg in front of him, slowly walking backwards. Kunal jumped when his foot touched the mirror. He turned to see his reflection staring back at him and breathed a sigh of relief. The mirror's image rippled and he saw the lady he'd seen downstairs. She floated slowly but steadily towards him, her hands by his, her, her sides. Kunal backed away, but as quick as lightning, she thrust out her arms and grabbed his shoulders. Her grip was cold but firm. She flicked her head upward, throwing back her fringe, revealing her face. Her face was pale and her eyes were sunken and bloodshot. She opened her mouth to scream and said, 